Hi, this is Ben Kenny or Ben Kenny signing in. Hope you're all doing well. Good to talk to you again. And, uh, well, greetings. Uh, I don't know how well this uh, quality is in terms of the video. Probably pretty terrible and cringe worthy, but we'll have to make do for the time being. Now, the thing that I wanted to focus on today a little bit is a somewhat well-studied or at least well-complained about phenomenon within specifically the poetry world and specifically in modern times. There's something about what is called the affected poet's voice when uh, performing poetry that just really grates the ears of many critics and many audience members alike and also, I should say, fellow poets. And it's something that I think about quite a bit. I mean, there are these very interesting interviews that I've seen with some of the great poets of the 50s and 60s. Uh, you can find them on YouTube, these old interviews with, you know, these poets wearing these uh, black spectacles, 50s dad spectacles, I call them, and... Uh, you know, they have these very form-fitting suits on, and they're sitting back leisurely smoking a pipe and thoughtfully kind of just, you know, looking up at the ether as if pulling the words from the sky and then delivering them to the interviewer in this kind of passe, blasé, but yet obviously invested manner. So the interviewer in this old 50s, 60s newscaster-type voice will say, So... Mr. So-and-so, could you please tell us a little bit about your poetic process and then read us a fragment from one of your well-known poems. I'm not very good at that, uh, you know, stereotypical newscaster voice of yore, as you can rightly tell. Uh, but what, uh, rightly tell, is that the right word? Well, uh, <laughs> that you can well tell, I suppose is better uh, said. And, uh... You know, he kind of looks back, he or she, it's not just, I mean, also Anne Sexton did something along those lines in the same uh, uh, series. So, it's men and women and anything in between and beyond, uh, from what I can tell. So, it's, it's, not, it's not specific to gender or sex or anything, it's absolutely a human folly all over <laughs> and everywhere. So, here we go. So he's sitting back, the newscaster will say something like, So, Mr. Wellington, I'm just making that name up, I know of no major poets with the surname Wellington, but let's just suppose we have a Jimmy Wellington, master poet. Well, Jimmy Wellington, we'll say Sir Jimmy Wellington, is sitting back in his black suit, let's make it a seersucker even, and he has this, cold, this old gentleman's pipe, you know, let's make it even a corn cob pipe. As absurd as that a picture that would be, you know, he would he would he would he would rock it. That's the whole point because he would be a kind of stuffy professor type, and he would sort of ironically be smoking a corn cob pipe in a seersucker suit. So he goes like this, takes a draw. Well, uh, and bear in mind this is an American. Let's say he's a professor at. A university in Minnesota, okay? 19, circa 1960s. Let's say horn-rimmed glasses. So, Mr. Wellington, could you please tell us a little bit about your new major work, The Birds? Well, uh, yes, uh, The Birds, yeah. Mm, uh. The Birds is a, is a piece of work that I, uh, well, well, I... It's hard to say. I had a bit to do with my recent divorce from old Molly. <laughs> old Molly. Well, eh, the cow. But anyway, let me tell you a little bit. Well. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice ring as of Saturn. Yeah. So I'll read you one of my poems and give you a sense of Molly. Strangely enough, and ironically enough, I call it Molly. All right, sir, this poem is called, as you guessed it, Molly. Rocking upon the boats of evil, 
rapidly rhapsodizing my rickety old barns of yore, tricking the cows from the shed along the lines of my erratic radiation. I felt absurdly important along the lines of a farmstead in my youth, now an elder in a suit, riding and rifting and ribbling along the river of shame, while wild age by the garrets and the mews of the dens and the dirgy catacombs. Were I ever a rebar that you might have removed from my skeletal links, and rather would I have told you, O oh Molly, Molly, my greatest feudal fiefdom, that I had once found time to annex a lie. O oh Molly, you were the one colony that I laid bare, that I found along the river banks of adulthood and brought home to the mausoleum of my old age, O oh, Molly. So, I just made that all up now, pretty badly done, improvised, but it gives an idea. Of course, I'm completely going over the top with this rendition, but it's something along those lines. So I've always been fascinated by this sort of like putting on airs with regard to the way that poetry and even prose, for that matter, is read by authors in a public manner. Now, I have observed there are some poets who will speak as they, or I'm sorry, would read poems to their audience as they would speak. And that is a kind of popular-ish manner of reading one's work. But I don't know, it may be minority because this sort of uh, putting on airs with regard to reading one's poetry, this manner of, what did I call it before? Uh, the the uh, pretentious poet, poet's voice. I, I had a, I'm not sure if that's what I called it before. <laughs> anyway, it's something along those lines. You know what I mean, I'm sure. So, now this guy, I gave him like a really bad fake, Eng you know, would wanna be dialect British accent even though the, this our 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 Sir Jer, Jimmy Wellington is from Minnesota, we'll say. But then you have guys who will speak with, you know, a standard American accent. But it's by the way, when I say guys, I mean any possible uh, combination of identity. It really doesn't matter. It can be anybody, really. Uh, so it's uh, you know. He might be like this. Yeah, hi, my name is Kyle Winston. Uh, I'm originally from Florida. Uh, I'd like to read you guys a poem of mine. Okay, this is called Surfing with Wendy. Surfing with Wendy. The words of my lasting fatherly memory. And I could hear the wave crest ripening like old fruit on the vine silver and why would the clouds have told me that surfing was less than they were were they not themselves white fluffy surfers abroad in the sky i a lowly insect in the world of serfdom a small human ant with a surfboard Thank you. That was surfing with Wendy. Well, pretty pathetic. Not pathetic, pathetic with a B. Meaning anticlimactic. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just making st stuff up as I go along. And, uh, well, it's interesting to me. So it's just, you hear these sort of uh, elongated uh, pauses, these fakely thoughtful pauses, these strange uh, kind of drawing out of vowels and this sort of mumbly, uh, <laughs> elo this sort of mumbly, uh, like, uh, su su sustainment or sustaining of, of 
of uh, you know this of the final uh, vow uh, final what's the word I guess final vowel and then you know if there's a consonant at the end of that word yeah you know, just it, it, so you know let's say the word is rendition it's like and it was the final rendition okay so actually I guess it's not the final vowel it was the n actually so yeah so it's the final consonant in that case although n is uh, nasal so let's try it with let's say kick and it was the final kick kick yeah so i guess actually so it it seems like you 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 pitch you you cause the pitch to go higher and it becomes kind of monotonous a plateau and it can either be the final vowel or the final consonant depending on what type of consonant it is so anyway, I just thought that was very curious. I mean, obviously you have various sort of in-stone manners of reciting poetry in various world cultures, and some of them are right well accepted. They're considered to be completely normal and the status quo within a given culture. Within the Western canon, when you have people reading poetry in this absurdly pretentious manner, it's... The thing is, I don't know if it's entirely the status quo. I think it's, I think in a way, there's there's a, a very real war in a way between the people who say, "Oh no, you should read poetry aloud as you would speak to and to to a fellow person normally," and those who say, "Well, no, actually, it's what demarcates poetry. It's what makes it recognizable, especially." as poetry to read in this pretentious poet's voice with all these odd ebbings and flow of the voice. So here I have, this is a separate subject here but related, uh, I have these stones which I've carved individual poems, haiku, into. Now, not the first to do that. You'll be able to find poem stones all over the world Obviously, you have clay tablets going back to ancient Sumeria. Uh, you have you have uh, the poem garden, the poem path, the haiku path in New Zealand. My brother actually went there upon my request when he was in New Zealand uh, and took pictures of these various haiku stones because I uh, that was a great, uh, uh, truly a great, great gift on his part. So. My idea is that I want to put stones of mine that I have carved into stone. I want to put them into the caves at Qumran, which is near the Dead Sea in modern Israel, similar to how the the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls were planted in caves in days past. So this is an idea I've, ha I've had. I've asked my friend Michael or Michael to assist me in this. So we're going to have to actually hike up the sides of cliffs, find a good little cave of, of sorts, hike in, real spelunkers. I mean, I don't know how, these are not like cave caves, but you know, they're like, you know, significant indents in the cliff face. And we'll place them inside at hidden lo locations within to be discovered in some at some future date uh well it's a bit silly and self-important but you know in a way it's like what else does one have to do in life i mean you do have your responsibilities take care of your responsibilities but why not do something crazy and self-important on the side i mean truly it's not a bad thing to give yourself a little bit of uh you know to trust yourself a little bit so I said in this, in my actual book, this I wrote in English here, at the beginning of Hamahbelet Asura, or the Moonlit Notebook, which I just published, I say, Who should be touched by even one of the poems herein? It is the poet's sincerest wish that the reader commit that poem to stone, clay, vellum, data crystal, or the like, and hide it preserved in Qumran caves and in buried hiding places around the worlds. So that's basically the idea I've had for that. No stealing, I'm sure that people will anyway, but why else would I have told you about it? So there are a lot of poems in Hebrew here. I don't imagine that too many people know Hebrew uh, among the subscribers, but if you want to learn, I'm happy to help. 
Uh, but in any case, I also do have a lot of poems uh, in other languages, including English. And I can also translate sort of off the cuff for now and then give official translations later in English and other languages of some of these works. So kind of what I wanted to do was to just give a kind of a sense, I guess, of the difference between this, you know, manner of, of telling your poems, that is to say, you know, you're talking to your interlocutor or interlocutor, however, however you're supposed to pronounce that word, to your fellow conversant in conversation, you know, you talk to them as you would with a friend or a family member or a person upon the, you know, on the town, as it were. Or you read it in this kind of absurd, cranked up, pretentious poet's voice. So let's see if we can kind of hear the difference, okay? So I'm going to read this in Hebrew and then I'll do a kind of free off the cuff translation into English afterward. So I'll start with a more or less conversational manner of reading the Hebrew. All right. Le'eba vugman shirenu haseminali. Et svekotai ehbetim. Piklipote goze melech az ve nirkechu al yede hasnaim. Pasati sof sof hadroa ve betavnit kaskase ha'efe. Ve shuhrarti ch'eres ha'shamsha. Ven asagrir u ven asharav asahu tslofhe ha'onot. בהגוון בני אור, צל ומוות, פסעתי סוף סוף הדרורה, בתבנית קשקשי האפעה, ושוחררתי כארץ השמשה. It's very basic, I didn't read that quite how I intended, but, you know, completely without frills is the whole point. All right, so now, let's try it with this affected, there, there we go, affected was the word I had, I had meant, yeah, that I forgot about. So this affected, pretentious poet's voice. Et svekotai hebetim Biklipote goze melech az Ve nilkehu l'al yede hasnoim Fosati sof sof hadrora Betavnit kaskase ho ef'e Ve shuhrarti cha'eres ha'shamsha Bein asagrir u vein asharav O sahu tzlofhe ha'onot Veheg van vane or tzelu mavet Pasati sof sof hadrora Betavnit haskhase ha'ef'e Veshuhrarti cha'eres ha'shamsha It sounds a bit like a ghost. <laughs> That's the very thing. All right, so to Eva Vugman, our seminal song or our seminal poem. I would say seminal song sounds better, right? All right, so my doubts, I hid them in walnut shells then, and they were taken by the squirrels. I tread finely liberty word in the in the uh, in the tabnit, in the in the pattern of the scales of the viper, and I was released like venom sunward between the rainy days and between the sandstorms or the dry season. Uh, the uh, how do I say this? The the eels of the seasons swam in the variation lits of light, shadow, and death. I tread finely, liberty word. In the pattern of the uh, of the scales of the viper, and I was released like. Uh, venom sunward. So now in the affected pretentious poet's voice. Again, I'm just making up this translation as I go along. I have to do official an official one at some later point. Anyway, so my doubts, I hid them 
in the walnut shells then, and they were taken by the squirrels. I tread finely liberty word in wait <laughs> in the why well, can't I think of this word <laughs> in the pattern of the scales of the viper and I was released like venom sunward and between the rainy days and the hot dry days swam the eels of the seasons oh and the variation lits of light, shadow, and death. I tread finely liberty word in the pattern of the scales of the viper, and I was released like venom sunward. Well, this is absurd, <laughs> and I completely went out of, but this was completely a nuts, but how about this? A final accounting in the stocks of the field, in a council of scarecrows, of cricket and sparrow. They would spar with scimitars of moonbeams and snipe with ninja stars of stars, but for the moonless night of celestial spilt molasses slopped across cosmic mammy's starless kitchen countertop, lit up only by aged light bulb of yawn ramshackle farmhouse and the wispy flake of distant Venus. But just so, amongst cricket and sparrow, amid their midnight star snipe and moonbeam spar in a council of scarecrows, in a final accounting in the stocks of the field, though I set about the endless task of missing the one who brought me with her love to this tribunal. So that's not really a conversational tone, but it is a uh, roughly colloquial sort of storytelling tone. Now with the affected pretentious poet's voice, and then we'll wrap this up for the, for the day. A final accounting in the stocks of the field in a council of scarecrows, of cricket and sparrow. They would spar with scimitars of moonbeams and snipe with ninja stars of stars. But for the moonless night of celestial spilt molasses slopped across cosmic mammy's starless kitchen countertop, lit up only by aged light bulb of yarn ramshackle farmhouse and the wispy flake of distant Venus, uh, but just so, amongst cricket and sparrow, amid their midnight star snipe and moonbeam spa, in a council of scarecrows, in a final accounting in the stocks of the field, do I set about the endless task of missing the one who brought me with her love to this tribunal. Obviously, this ridiculous voice I'm pretending to... To to a well, I'm I'm well not pretending, but that I am affecting on purpose, but in a melodramatic kind of over the top way for the point of illustration is influenced by T. S. Eliot reading The Wasteland. You can find a recording of this on uh, YouTube, of course, and it's legendary among a few friends and I who we used to basically just you know we would just how do I say this, we would lampoon the shisa out of this. Specifically the first line of the wasteland, if I remember correctly, it's April is the cruelest month. Now when you listen to this affected poet's voice of his, uh, it's really just astounding. I mean, I understand it was an earlier age. I mean, this was read, you know, many, 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 many decades back in an earlier century. You know, but he was from America moved to England, basically. So it's kind of hard to tell, like, just how affected it is, obviously, because to understand the shifts of dialect and of register over time, especially with old recordings, it's not always quite clear. So something that sounds ridiculously over-the-top pretentious and affected to us now may not have seemed 
just so affected and pretentious in an earlier age. But it depends on several factors within linguistics. But anyway, so he says something along these lines. April is the cruelest month. So that's April is the cruelest month. I'm not getting this quite right. I'm just doing a kind of a parody of it. But it's, you know, something along the lines of April is the cruelest month. Really, it's just something else. It truly affected me. Now, this guy, you know, T.S. Eliot, he, he, he was a bit of an anti-Semite, as was Ezra Pound, uh, his sort of cohort in The Lost Generation, among others. Uh, and, you know, it's not an uncommon theme. But yet, you know, despite that, I try to, you know, not worry so much about the kind of the vagaries of, of people's opinions about others and try to give primacy to the poetry itself. It's not always easy, but you have to you have to try. That's what I feel. So even if you don't agree with the politics or even the personality or the ideologies of a particular poet, you should still appreciate them a as a poet as far as you possibly can. So you can have a Jewish poet, I'm sorry, a Jewish reader appreciating a Muslim poet, a Muslim reader appreciating a Jewish poet, a Christian reader appreciating a Hindu poet, a Hindu poet appreciating a Christian poet, and so on and so forth all across the gamut of world civilizations, religions, cultures, credos, sexualities, any kind of lifestyle choice, not choice, I'm sorry, uh, any sort of lifestyle uh, identity and choice, depending on what it is. Obviously, sexuality is not a choice. That that was the wrong uh, <laughs> juxtaposition. Uh, but the other, there are other things that are a choice. You know, religion is a choice to a degree. Obviously, you know, you may be born into a religion and it's not really so plausible that you should be able to just up and leave that. I mean, you could secretly be an atheist or convert to another religion, but there are certain situations where you don't really have that option openly, at least. Or you could, but it would mean leaving your family behind and moving to another country, for example. Uh, it could be risk of death. I could, there are many reasons why people would be averse to that. So it is a choice in a way, but there are many things that are not a choice. Sexuality, who you are born as, in many respects... You know, there are certain neural aspects of a person which you don't choose, but which are part and parcel of who you are. And, uh, you know, just, you just have to accept that and celebrate it, ultimately. I mean, that's... <laughs> well, that's it can be a bit of a problematic thing if you take it to its fully universal conclusion, because, you know, I can talk about a person who suffers from certain clinical illnesses, should you celebrate that? Um, and there are people who say yes. I mean, it, this is a very difficult subject, and it's one that we start entering the moral philosophy, and as I'm, you know, I'm kind of nervously scratching my eyebrow here, because, you know, this is a really difficult subject, I'm not going into this at the moment, but my point is, is that regardless of, even if you're dealing with a murderer who wrote a novel the question is are you going to boycott the novel because of who that person was or are you going to read that novel as art regardless who, of who its author was now obviously the author is part and parcel of what that novel or poem is uh, well okay so I better go but uh, th that's the general gist of today's talk, and please leave your comments below, and uh, let me know what you think.